she never learned their mother tongue of Hungarian. She was an avid and gifted polyglot from an early age. As I look at your background, it, it seems clear that you, you didn't know from childhood that you would be a linguist, but that you were always fascinated with languages. And I wonder, Absolutely. you know, do you know where that came from? Was that planted somewhere? Actually, actually, uh, it, there's probably a part of my family that, that has to do with it. One, I think some people are just interested in language. I mean, I, I just happen to find it easy to talk all kinds of languages, and I find it amusing, and I just love them. But I think there was a personal thing in my life as well, which is that I had an older brother who had cerebral palsy, and he was really smart. In fact, he ultimately got a PhD from Cornell, and he was a smart, lovely guy, but he had motoric incapacities such that his speech was extremely difficult to understand, and I was probably the person who really understood it best. So when I was a kid, I was the person who, um, when my brother Marty had problems saying something, I was the person who knew what he was saying and told everybody. So I guess my early experience as an interpreter had something to do with it, too. Well, that's really interesting. Um, and then you went to college and you studied literature and history, and then you discovered psycholinguistics. Or do you know what happens then? No, psycho, no, was it psycholinguistics, by the way? It, it was. Well, it, it wasn't called that. It was called the psychology of language. I had taken French and Spanish and Arabic and, no, I took Arabic literature, sorry, and Russian and Norwegian. And I don't know, a lot, I had taken a lot of languages, but my senior year in college, I took a course on the psychology of language taught by a new young assistant professor who just got from the University of Michigan. And his name was Roger Brown. And the course blew me away because it, it really talked about the things that were interesting to me, about how it is that human beings store language in their heads, how you acquire language, what happens when you lose language. And Roger Brown then went on to be somebody who made a major breakthrough in this field, right? Studying Adam yeah. and Eve and Sarah. <laughs> were those real things? No, they were but I think, um, I think you might be interested to know that uh, although they were made up names, they were real kids. They were kids in the Harvard uh, daycare or preschool, whatever it was called in those days. It was a big, uh, if, if you know Cambridge, Massachusetts, there's a, uh, a psychology building. It's called William James Hall. Right. And where William James Hall used to be, uh, where William James Hall is, there used to be a, a preschool in a Quonset hut. Uh, a leftover World War II Quonset hut. We used to go there and sit on tiny chairs with bacon quarters and with his heads. And what this study did was it, it sent people on a, like a monthly basis to children's houses and tape recorded all of the interaction between the child and parents. And then they came back and gave, uh, gave assistants or us, whoever we were, the uh, tapes and people transcribed those tapes type them out, just, just like the script of a play, and then a, a group of graduate students from Roger Brown would sit around the table looking at these transcripts and say, what's going on here? What are these kids doing? What, what's their language? What's their grammar? What's their sound system? How do they make a question? You know, we began to really look into what the development of language looked like in a very naturalistic setting. You know, as I started to really steep myself in understanding what you do and what you know, where it took me was um, I, I ended up learning German as a young adult and becoming uh -huh. fluent in German. Um, good. And good. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Sehr gut. And I, ganz gut. <laughs> and I had this experience. You know, one thing that happened then, which I was re recalling, was as I really learned the ins and outs of a new language, and, and German, of course, is very highly structured, so it was you know, it's quite intentionally learning the ins and outs. Yes, yes. I became aware that I didn't know, at least consciously, know much of that about my mother tongue, right? That I, that I wouldn't possibly be able to explain to someone else how I constructed a sentence in English the way I could construct a sentence in German. And, and this took me also, you know, I, I sense this excitement in your writing and in all the writing in your field about just how amazing it is that we learn language and inhabit it starting so young in our lives. Well, it is, it is remarkable, but, you know, the, the real appreciation of what we're doing didn't come until 
basically this century. There's, in the past, people were interested in, in language, how kids acquired language. You know, Charles Darwin wrote notebooks about one of his sons, and he outlined how the kid acquired language in, in some sense, but not in the sort of, what you might say, componential way that we now understand. Mm -hmm. Because now we understand that language is made of a bunch of subsystems, a sound system, a meaning system, a syntactic system that, that allows you to make sentences. Uh, and, and we know how those are structured in the languages we study. So now we can we can have the linguist describe the language. You know, for, you're quite right. If you ask a speaker for instance, what are the sounds of English, what they're going to tell you is, well, there are the vowels A, E, I, O, and Q. You know, they'll, they will name the, the alphabet letters, yeah. but they won't really know what the sounds of English are, and they won't know which ones are the important ones in some sense. Right. So, and so what I learned from you is that children start to acquire these things and as well as thousands of vocabulary words um, and rules and systems by the time they're three or four and that children do this in every known society whether it's literate or not in every language. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, liter literacy, written language is a, a very late acquisition in terms of human evolution. Human beings have been speaking for hundreds of thousands of years, maybe a million years. Nobody really knows because how are you going to reconstruct whether or not a particular group of people spoke. But it's part of our ancient, ancient heritage as humans. Spoken language is the basis I learned from which such things as written language stem. So I want to talk about um, something that was a big contribution of yours, the Lug Test. Uh, ah, yes. You know, again, in this, in this realm of what we take for granted and don't think hard enough about, you know, the fact that the children know grammatical forms that nobody's ever really tried to teach them, that, that young children say things they've never heard anyone say before. Right. Your test was kind of demonstrating that. It did. It did. The test showed that even very, very little kids, namely children of three, are, are able to make plurals of words they've never heard before and past tenses of verbs they've never heard before. And a lot of other forms in the language um, in a creative way that they've never heard before. The classic example is the wug itself, right? Uh -huh. The wug is a little creature looks like a little birdie. The rule one is get their attention. And you got to create a mythical creature. I mean, that's fun. <laughs> I, I did get to create a mythical creature yeah. who's been around for so long, it would be embarrassing to tell you. But, <laughs> but you know, what I showed, let's give the example of, of the wug. I, I drew a little picture of a little wug. And then there were two. So I say to kids, this is the wood. Now there's another one. There are two of them. There are two. And even little bitty kids say two wugs. Even little three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds without a problem fill in that reserve sound. Okay, Twyla. Uh, hi. Hi. I'm going to show you some pictures. Okay? What are they? You tell me. Wugs. Say that louder? Wugs. Well, this is great. Yeah. You can't use nonsense words because if you use regular words, you could just say, well, they memorized it. You know, say, like, here's a dog, now there's another one, there are two, and kids say two dogs. It only proves they've heard somebody say two dogs. Right, right. If they right, say two right. bugs. And then the plural in English is made the regular plural. Never mind children and oxen and rather yeah, than right, things right. like that. The regular plural in English has three different forms depending on the stem of the word that it's going to be added to. Now, what we found was that kids acquire these different forms of the plural in different order. So that it builds, that complexity builds. Well, it, well, it builds, but what's remarkable about it is that it builds in such a regular way. It, it isn't that kids learn language in bits and pieces and every kid does it a different way. Children have their own ways of learning. Children have their own styles, they have their own temperaments. But when it comes to the acquisition of language as a system, the children abstract the rules, if I can say it that way, and I hesitate to say it that way, but they abstract the rules of the language in very much the same order. Mm -hmm. As children speaking English acquire English in very much the same order of mm -hmm. whoever they are and wherever they are. That, that is a remarkable sort of universal. Right. Here is a man who knows how to zip. So what is he doing? He is... Zimmy. 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 I'm Krista T. 
Friendship and Emphasis on Being, today with psycholinguist Jean Burko Gleason. He has to do with every day. His job is to sip, so he's a sipper. Very, very, very good. So this observation gave rise to uh, linguistics and psycholinguistics' own version of the nature versus nurture debate, <laughs> I might say. Well, there is one out there, and there has been an enduring one out there. But um, we talked about children having rules. This is why I, I was hesitant to talk about abstractions and things. We said we could describe what children do. We could say, okay, look, they make the plural, then they do this and they do that. Right. But then, then you can say, this is what they do. How do they do it, or why do they do it? Those are different questions. On the one side, you've got people who believe that much of language is innate, just hardwired into your head. When you're born, you have the principles of grammar in place, all of those things. And you have a language acquisition device. On the other end of the spectrum, you have other good friends of mine who are of a much more behaviors uh, view, who say, well, you have uh, learning principles and parents you spend a huge amount of time with children and they are basically programmed to shape their language by reinforcing good attempts, by ignoring bad attempts, by modeling, by many different kinds of learning uh, activities. In the middle, you've got the interactionist world and that's where most of us are now. And the interactionist people are saying, look, you, you have a capacity. What I would say is your brain is not formed when you're born. You have to build your brain. Look, look at the look at what happened to the children in Romania who were taken well care of in nurseries or in, in orphanages. People fed them. They gave them clothing. They didn't talk to them. Those children's brains did not develop. Your brain develops through interaction with other people. And are they? Do they have serious language? Issues? Oh, please! They have serious every issue. They are seriously compromised human beings. Mm -hmm. with terrible, terrible problems. If you so, uh, we think, or I think, and a lot of people of my bent think that that language develops through interaction with other people talking to you, and that it is not through mere exposure to the language. Mm -hmm. In other words, you could believe, oh, you got the principles. It's sort of what you said to begin with. You got the principles; they're innate. You just have to hear the language, set the parameters. And experiment that I would propose for that is if you really think that, take your child and set her in front of the, I don't know, the Chuck Chi or the Korean cable news every morning at the end of the year. <laughs> they start tell speaking me, Korean. Tell me how much Chuck Chi that child can speak. Uh -huh. And you know what the answer is going to be? It's going to be none. Right. Because children don't learn that way. That is not how you acquire language. Oh, this is my belief, all right? right. I mean, it's, it's not just a belief. It's from everything I have seen. And there is, of course, a fellow at MIT now, I suppose you have seen the work of Deb Roy at MIT. He's not a linguist, he's an engineer who has collected 350,000 hours of data on his child growing oh, up. Oh, this, this is a child project? It, yeah, it was a project oh. at MIT. You uh -huh. can see he gave a TED lecture on it. And if the, uh, listeners are interested, it's a wonderful TED lecture that you can see describing how his little boy acquired individual words and you could just see the child going from raw to you know to water along the way but with this tremendous interaction with the people around him. So you've all I'm sure seen time lapse videos where a flower will blossom as you accelerate time. I'd like you to now experience the blossoming of a speech form. My son soon after his first birthday would say gaga to mean water. And over the course of the next half a year, he slowly learned to approximate the proper adult form, water. So we're going to cruise through half a year in about 40 seconds.
first two years that we really focused on, we've identified each of the 503 words that he learned to produce by his second birthday. He was an early talker. And so we started to analyze why. Why were certain words born before others? And what we found was this curious phenomenon that caregiver speech was systematically dipped to a minimum, making language as simple as possible, and then slowly development is, is a cooperative event that happens between children and the people around them. And I think you need not just the cognitive stuff to understand how to, you know, abstract rules, but you also need to have uh, emotional underpinnings. Mm -hmm. You have to care. You know, why, why are you talking? You know, you, you have to care about other people. And, you know, people who don't care. I mean, one of the problems with, say, kids who have uh, problems like autism is that many of them are disconnected from other people and are, are thereby uh, much impaired in communicating with other people. And you're saying so that that lack of motivation is critical. I think the lack of affect, the lack of attachment, uh -huh. all those things. Yeah. I, I think that language has many components. Like language, how does language begin in, in kids? It doesn't begin with the child suddenly looking around and saying, wow, I'm the greatest subject of urban and object. It begins with communication with the people around that kid. In the first place, as you know, babies are listening to language before they're born. <coughs> right. in, in utero, mm -hmm. babies are listening, and we now have technologies that enable us to show that not only are they listening, that if they're hearing two languages, they're beginning to build a bilingual brain mm -hmm. before they're born, and they're making preferences so that when they're, by the time they're born, Babies prefer to listen to their own mother as against somebody else. So I think in the beginning, language is there so we can say, Mommy, I want you. <laughs> and little kids are very good at that. You know, it, it, this feels analogous and, and related to me to the, to the more expansive understanding we're gaining of intelligence in general. Like that, that's not just a matter of information plugged in. I mean, even the field of artificial intelligence has changed. That robots are more interactive, and that that's how knowledge, how uh, important knowledge then is acquired and built. Well, I, I don't know robots, but I do know maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, here's the thing: a lot of linguists who make theories about how to learn language don't have to do that. <laughs> they, they, they they haven't had that uh, that experience of seeing what goes on. I mean, that was why it was, I think, such a shock to folks at MIT when Deborah came up with this, the engineer. Oh, because he worked with you. <laughs> he, was, he was studying his own child, and, and it's technology that nobody else can do, obviously, because he's got hundreds of cameras, mirrors. His whole house is wired. His whole house is it's just incredible. Oh, yeah, we'll wonder about those therapy bills.
same holding. You know, if anybody who thinks that children require a language to imitate you is making a mistake. I wrote a paper called Do Children Imitate? Uh, not based on, just with that as a thought, because then I went out and I found lots of kids and I, I made a thing like the word test, except it was all irregulars, and I gave the kids the answer. Okay, so I said, I said, here's a goose, now there are two geese. What's this, a goose? What are these, two geeses, two gooses, whatever. I mean, they, they, they didn't give them they the They used the they, they over-regularized, okay. basically, is what, is what we say. So the point of that paper was that kids will use their own system at the stage where they are. They're not educated yet. Not that you're not having an effect on them, but they're, they're not learning language through pure imitation. They're building an internal system. For that, my teacher holding the baby rabbits ended up as a big headers in Psychology Today and Harvard Magazine. <laughs> So the same child said, we had a conversation one time, uh, I was talking about giraffes, and she said, what do giraffes eat? And I said, well, they eat leaves mostly. And she said, and what do they eat lessly? Oh. You know, so yeah. you, you, if you're a linguist, you pick up on things like right. that. It gives you ideas of how you, of, of what's going on. But what, what you also see there is that they're really working, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're yes. putting things together. You see the creativity. You, you see that they're often having systematic knowledge. Yes, that they have a systematic. And that was, I think that was the big excitement. That that was, you know, and getting back to what's good about the web test is I've been the fact that, uh, of course, the webs are so cute. I say that because I drew them myself. <laughs> we were very poor in graduate school. Now I use some people have, you know, take it to the department of graphics. <laughs> is about more than language, right? But it's about more than words or sentences constructed. Mm -hmm. Now, there's this phrase that's all through your writing in your field from Stanley Hall, who is the father of developmental psychology. The content of children's minds. minds. I mean, just that yeah. phrase, the contents yeah. of children's minds. Yeah. It's big. Yes, yeah, it's, it's bigger than we thought. That's, you, you were right earlier on when you said that we're coming to understand so much more about the we, we, we understand so much more about babies. I mean, you know, there was a time when people thought that babies had no sensation. Right? Right. Right. You do remember that people used to do open heart surgery on babies under, without anesthesia, under the uh, impression that babies couldn't feel anything. They sort of thought they were like blind puppies when they were born, you know, just squirming masses. Mm -hmm. So now, as we get more uh, sophisticated in our, in our ways of, of investigating, This is true about every other creature, too. So those of us who still eat lobsters, for instance, uh, you know, now have got to worry about the social life of a lobster. Mm -hmm. you know, so the, uh, the, uh, the whole question of sentience, <coughs> the whole question of having meaningful lives, I think, has, uh, has spread. It turns out that an awful lot of creatures have complex and meaningful lives. one that, that slows us down a little bit. Yes. You know, when you realize, you know, you should start, uh, well, if we're talking about language, but if you start thinking about the things that might not be so good in the country, a lot of it has to do, in my book, with not realizing the sentience of other creatures mm -hmm. and thereby causing great badness. Of 